I need some help right now. I need someone who has been in the presence and the glory of God. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. You're not clapping for me. You're clapping for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega. Come on, push past the flesh. Begin to praise Him. Come on, begin to glorify His name. The Word of God says that He inhabits the praises of His people. See, when you're making noise and you're praising the Lord, God is showing up. How many want God to show up here today? How many came here expecting something from God? How many came anticipating a move of the Holy Spirit? How many came here today knowing, knowing that God is going to do it? Come on, somebody. It's not will He do it. He is going to do it. If you believe that, put your hands together one more time and make some noise in the house of God. Hallelujah. So Numbers 14, verses 20 to 24, just a few scriptures there. We're going to use that as our launching pad. If you're there, say amen. 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 God's word says this. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. How many of there's a but here? Come on, somebody. But God. But because my servant Caleb, come on, somebody, has a difference. Everybody say different spirit. And follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to. And his descendants will inherit it. His descendants, not just him, but his children. Come on, somebody. And his children's children. Come on, somebody. And his children's children's children. That means when you obey God, not, you won't be the only one being blessed. When you, when you bless the Lord, your children will be blessed. Their children will be blessed. Come on. How many can thank God for generational blessings? Come on, somebody. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yo, so, so this morning, I want to initiate our time together with a life-changing statement. How far you go and how much you grow isn't just decided by what God believes about you. It's equally impacted by what you believe about you. Oh, come on now. What you believe about you. So, so I've tagged the title to this message, and I've entitled it this. It's all in your head. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, get out of your head. It's a dangerous place to be. Come on, somebody. Hey, can you turn, can you turn the, uh, the monitors down just a little bit? They're really overdriven. Is somebody back there? Yeah, please turn those things down. Thank you. So, so, so the word of God, so, so that particular concept and idea was actually articulated by, by, by one of the wisest men in the world, right? When you when we talk about Solomon, right? So Solomon wrote in Proverbs 23, 7, he said this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. See, it doesn't say as God thinks, it says as God thinks, so is he. So God can think one thing. And you can think another. God might be thinking something that is really positive, but if you're not careful, you could be thinking negative. See, so it doesn't always align itself. See, this suggests that that we actually behave in a way that is consistent with the way we see ourselves, not necessarily the way God sees us. Oh, come on. Sometimes there's a disconnect. Everybody say disconnect. Sometimes there's a disconnect, and somewhere along the line, we got a bridge that gap. See, it also suggests this, that at times there may be an argument, there may be an inconsistency between the way God sees you and the way you see yourself. And see, and, and whoever wins this argument in your head is actually wins and develops, and it also dictates and determines what happens with you, in you, through you, and for you. So in other words, how you see yourself determines your future. How you see yourself is really because what God is trying to do, the Bible says that we are created in his image, but then God is changing us day by day from glory to glory, come on somebody, from faith to faith to be more in the image of him. So you see, how you see yourself is so super important. As a matter of fact, there's an old story about 
about an Indian. Uh, he was a chief of the, of, the, of the tribe, and his son, his, actually his grandson came to him. His son was always getting in trouble. How many know, does anybody around here get in trouble once in a while? All the husbands go, yep, I stay in trouble. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, I had to put air conditioning in the doghouse. How many know what I'm talking about? Anybody know? No, nobody know about that? No, y'all don't know about that. It's just me. It's just me. So, so anyway, so, so, so he's, saying, he's, saying, he's saying, listen, uh, you're always in trouble. And, and one of the things that's wrong is that, see, inside of us, in our head, there's, there's these two wolves. And these two wolves are constantly in conflict. One's a good wolf and one's a bad wolf. So the, son, the grandson thought about that and said, okay, well, Grandpa, uh, can you tell me who wins? He said, sure, the one you feed. The one you feed wins. So the question is, what are we feeding ourselves? Are we feeding ourselves, come on, somebody, are we feeding ourselves in the right way and, and, and spiritually from the Lord, or are we letting the world dictate who we become? Because if you start feeding yourself the things of this world, you'll end up like the world. But if you start feeding yourself the things of God, of faith and strength, come on, somebody, then God will be able to use you and raise you up, come on, somebody, and be able to do something amazing in your life. See, I believe that this is so important for us to understand. So, so how, do I know that, how do I know you have arguments in your mind? Number one, I have them too. Come on, somebody. Every one of us, no, none of us are exempt from those conversations that go on on the inside. But that's not the only reason why. The other reason why is because I read my Bible. <laughs> and my Bible is very clear about this. As a matter of fact, if you continue to see, you'll, you'll see that the Bible speaks about what's happening in your mind. And you see, it's how, how do I know that? See, the Bible says that mental arguments, come on, are a tactic of spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. So if the devil keeps you confused, he'll keep you conflicted. If your mind is divided, we'll remain disrupted. So what can, you know, you, you need to understand that you can't be a child of God and not be attacked by the enemy. Just know that that's going to happen just because you know Jesus. Come on, somebody. The attacks are going to come. It shouldn't surprise us that there's opposition. You know why? Because opposition is a sign of progress. See, if you're seeing opposition in your life, that means God's getting ready to promote you. Come on, you're progressing because that resistance is making you stronger. See, you can't be a child of God. And one of the ways the enemy attacks every one of us is by placing these arguments. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls them vain imaginations. Vain imaginations. Those are, those are worthless uh, conversations that are going on and thoughts in our minds that create, co- that create arguments. They, they conceive conflict inside of us. James wrote about it, and James said this. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you're conflicted and you're divided, that means you're unstable. Everybody say unstable. unstable. That means you can't get your footing you're, just, you're, you're, you're off balance. You, you can't quite do what you want to do because your mind, because wherever your mind goes, your life follows. Wherever your mind goes, the rest of you follow. So we have to make sure that we stay very, very close to God. And, and here's how Paul wrote about this. So Paul talks about this too in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. It says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Listen to this, New King James Version. Casting down arguments. Some versions say imaginations, vain imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into that captivity to the obedience of Christ. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to entertain your thoughts. You don't have to entertain. Just because it goes in your head doesn't mean it has to stay there. Because how many of the enemy will whisper in your ear too? And we need to understand that if it doesn't line itself up with the Lord, then you know it's not God. And if that's the case, then you have to take authority. It's just to bring into obedience, into captivity. That means you take that thought that's in your mind and you take it captive. And you say, you know what? You don't belong here. I'm going to evict you. I'm going to evict you. Can you please turn down the monitors? Please. Thank you. Just turn down the monitors for me. Thank you so much. See, I I believe this is so important for us to understand because, see, I know that we have arguments, and sometimes we have arguments with each other. But I'm talking to a few folks in this room that might be honest enough to say this. I have a lot of arguments, but most of them are with me. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Most of them are with me. It's internal because your biggest enemy is your inner me. 
So we need to understand that we have those conflicts within our hearts. So, so we have to stay close to God and, and understand that whether you think it. See, what happens is this. You hear these thoughts like, I can't do that. I can't be that. I can't have that. How many of you know we need to take the word can't completely out of our dictionary? It needs to stay complete. Because when I read my Bible in the book of Philippians, it says, I can. Turn to the neighbor and say, neighbor, I can. It says, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ, come on, who strengthens me. Listen, listen. And you know, you know what I do when I can't do something? I'm going to give you a revelation. You ready for this? Yes. Google it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> if I can't do it, I'll go on Google, and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to go on YouTube, and I'll get a video. Come on, somebody. Listen, at the end of the day, I'm being practical. At the end of the day, if I can't do it, I can figure out where to get the information. Amen. <laughs> So at the end of the day, I, when people tell me they can't do something, I say, well, that's an excuse. Because you got access to Google on your phone. Come on, look it up. Figure it out. You can do it. God is good. Everybody say, God is good. All the time. See, and wh whichever you believe. See, if you say you can't or you say you can, you're right. Either way, whatever you believe is going to determine and dictate the outcomes in your life. You know, I, I believe it's very important for us to understand the things that come into our mind and how we need to neutralize them. So, I, so I've got these boxes up here, and um, actually, I did this the first service. And one of these boxes is what's contained in your mind. The other boxes are the hand of God. So we need to take the things that are in our minds and put them into the hands of God. Can I hear an amen? amen? So what are the things that you're asking for? What, what are the things you're talking about, Pastor? Here, let me, let me give you an example. Here's one that we look at and we say, man, and you got to turn it over to God. Here, you ready for this? You're unqualified. You're not qualified to do what God is calling you to do. How could, you, you're like Moses at the burning bush. Come on, somebody. Well, well, I can't talk too well. I, I, I'm so slow to speak, and, and I get nervous around people. And, and, and see, we can start making excuses. Here's the problem. When you make an excuse with God, he already knows what's inside of you. See, maybe you need to discover something that you don't know is already there, and God's going to start calling you by name. Listen to me. He calls you by name, and he calls your gifts. He calls them out. So you may not know they're there, but all of a sudden God says, that's okay, because here's what God specializes. He qualifies the unqualified. Oh, come on. Can you give the Lord a praise? That, that means all of us got a chance. Come on. We've all got a chance. So you take that, that, that thought and you say, okay, devil, it's going to be in God's hands. Come on. Then here's a good one. Here's the one. Here's the thought. You're a failure. You're a failure. Can I tell you that just because you fail doesn't make you a failure? Do you know that all, I mean, do we have anybody that's failed at anything? Anybody that's, that's willing to admit it? I think every single hand should go up and say, yeah, we've all blown it. Come on. Somewhere along the line, every single one of us has fallen short. But just because you fail doesn't make you a failure. See, so you, you become a failure when you don't get back up again. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to get back up. You got to get back up and keep on pushing and keep trying again. So, you know, you're not a failure. See, to fail is addressing your action. Failure is addressing your character. At the end of the day, we're not failures. We do fail, but praise God, we get back up again. Amen. Can anybody say amen? amen. So, you, so, 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 so take that thought and say, devil, in Jesus' name, I'm going to give it to God. All right, here we go. Oh, this is a good one. So here's, here's, here's the pity part one. I'm not valued by God, and I'm not valued by anybody. Oh, come on, somebody. That's a thought that we get sometimes. We start sulking. Come on now. Don't get me wrong. This is real. It can be real, and the thought is real. But at the end of the day, if you want to understand God's love and the value that he places on you, then look at the cross. Oh, the Bible says that God so loved the world, that God so loved you that he gave his only son. Listen to this. Read that. He sacrificed all that he loved and had for you. See, that's a demonstration of love. I'll tell you, I can't even imagine what that looks like. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, while we were still lost, while we were still broken, while we were still jacked up. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you were really jacked up. Come on, somebody. 
while you were jack- while you were jacked up, he said, I'm going to go to the cross because there was no way to fix you unless he went to the cross first. So God took the first step. So you know what? Don't worry. God loves you. People love you. And don't, don't have a pity party on this one. Come on. Because the only one that shows up for a pity party is you and the devil. Come on. And that's it. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Well, pastor, you just don't know where I grew up. Come on. You don't know where I grew up. I had a very poor upbringing. Come on. I grew up in the hood. Come on, somebody. I grew up in a place that was poor. Maybe I didn't have all the things. And maybe you didn't. Maybe you grew up in a nice place. That's all good. Just because it's a nice place doesn't mean it's not dysfunctional. Come on, somebody. So at the end of the day, our upbringing, how we were raised. Pastor, you don't understand. I could never do that because my mama never did it. My daddy never did it. My cousin never did it. My brothers never did it. I mean, I'm locked into all this. And at the end of the day, I got people sitting in this place right now whose parents never did all that. But now they are graduates from college. Come on. Nobody ever graduated college. But now they're college graduates. How many of we can go further than the generation before us? Amen. We're not limited what anybody does. Past, pre- Come on. Give the Lord a praise and say, it doesn't matter where you're from. Listen, with Jesus, with Jesus, they said, Nazareth, come on, what good can come from Nazareth? And you know what? Jesus came from Nazareth to relate to us as well. So when those thoughts come, put them in God's hands. Oh, we're moving right along. And of course, this is a good one. This is a good one. I'm just not smart enough. I'm just not that smart, Pastor. You don't understand. Can I tell you being smart is not the key? Here's the key. Write this down. Being wise. Because I know some smart people that do dumb stuff. Come on, somebody. I know people with high IQs that are jacked up for real. They might be able to jump in their books and do all that, but when it comes to life, they are out of control. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? So it has nothing to do with being smart. It has, to be, it has to all to do with being wise. And, and see, so being smart, hey, you know what? You may not be all that smart. You might be wiser than the smartest person you know. Oh, so take that thought and drop it here. And now... Here's how you replace them. Now, when you hear all that and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired of the devil talking to you, you say, you know what, man? I am sick and tired. The devil is a liar. Oh, come on. The devil is a liar. You begin to proclaim that over yourself. Proclaim it over your mind. Just know this. The Bible says that he's not just a liar. They said there's no truth in him. Zero truth. That means everything he says is always a lie. He does no truth. So that, that means whatever he says... Just know it's the opposite. If he tells you you're not worthy, it's because you are. If he tells you you're not qualified, it's because you are. See, just know that every time you hear the devil saying negative, just say, devil, you're a liar. Come on, say it real loud. Devil, you're a liar. liar. You take that and you put that in God's hands. And then you go a little further. And you say, well, devil, let me just remind you of something. Because just in case you forgot, you've been defeated at the cross. You have been defeated at the cross. Come on. Somebody's got to say, devil, you are defeated. I don't fight you from a place of being defeated. I fight you from a place of victory. See, I've got the promises. I know, devil, you're already defeated. You belong. You know where the devil belongs? Come on, somebody. Under my feet. Come on. Get him off your back. Get him out of your ear and put him under your feet where he belongs. Come on. Give the Lord a praise if you believe that. And then on the way out, on the way out, devil, you will flee. Devil, you got to go. The Bible says resist the devil and he will, and he will, and he will. So all you got to do is resist them and say, no, the devil, no, 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 you're a liar, you're defeated. And I refuse to listen to that right there. And guess what happens? The devil has to turn around and start running. Say, devil, start running. So you don't see the devil face to face. You see the back of the devil as he's running away. Come on, somebody. That's the position that we need to keep him in. Always fleeing. Always running because we know he's defeated. Come on, somebody. We know he's a liar. And, he'll re- and when you resist him, he has nowhere to go but away. Come on. To tell the Lord, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for the authority and the power to overcome the devil. Put your hands together. Give the Lord a praise. Come on, make a little noise in the house of God. Woo! <laughs> you know, you know er, early in my Christian walk, uh, I was part of the worship team 
uh, because there weren't that many guys, and I volunteered. Come on, they just took me. I had to fill the space. I, I sat in the, uh, the back side of the choir. Like, I, I didn't have a microphone. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> they wanted people to stay in the building. Come on, somebody. So, so they kept the microphone away from me. Come on, somebody. But at the end of the day, you know, one day Pastor Victor, out of nowhere, just said, Carlos, would you consider leading worship? I said, leading worship? Are you serious? But, you know, but here's, what, here's the way I looked at it. Because, when, I mean, when I came to Christ, like, I didn't have, like, a person that spoke into my life. I had Pastor Victor. So I considered him, like, when he speaks, God speaks. I'm just saying. I mean, God spoke to him. And, man, when I was in the church in the beginning, I felt like he was talking straight to me. Does everybody ever feel like that? Sometimes you come to church, you got something going on, and the, pul- the pulpit, whoever's preaching, man, they're talking right at you. That's the way I felt. So when Pastor said, hey, would you consider that? I said, man, I'll consider it, but I just don't know. <laughs> so on a Wednesday night, he said, well, let's try it on Wednesday. There's not that many people. How many that's a good time to try? <laughs> if, I lose, if I lose a few, that's all right. Just I'm not going to bring you on Sunday yet, all right? Yeah. We're not going to go there. But, so I started doing it on Wednesday nights, and it, God started moving. Because let me tell you what, I didn't have all the talent, but let me tell you what I did have. I had a relationship with God. Yeah. And I loved God. And I, and I was a worshiper. I learned how to worship God. See, I spent too many t- years worshiping the devil. Come on, somebody. So when I got saved, I started worshiping God, and I didn't hold back. I was all in. Come on. I was ignorance on fire. Come on, somebody. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know anything call but I knew who Jesus was and that was enough man because I was just all in I don't listen I, I, I just don't know how to half step do, you, do I have anybody here that doesn't know how to half step that you're either in or you're not I mean nobody's straddling the fence I mean you're either all in with Christ either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all mm. So you see, I, I, that was such an amazing thing and, and I remember how God qualified me and then I thought the musicians and singers like, how are they going to follow me? I started making, thinking in my head, well, well I'm going to do this, but, like, these guys are all gifted. They're all talented. Come on, the best thing I could do is play on my radio. Come on, somebody. I could, I could pop a song in a CD. I mean, you know, what instrument do you play? Well, I play my radio, my CD player, you know. That, that's about <laughs> but you know what? Uh, something happened that was really cool. Because I, I realized that when God calls you, he gives you the authority that comes with it. See, the calling comes with the anointing. And whether you feel like you're qualified or not, the anointing's there. And see, people can't complain. They might think, man, you don't, don't sing too loud because you're off key all the time. Or, or you could do, but they can't, they can't argue with the anointing. Because when God shows up, listen, I've been in services that the best choir, the best harmony, and it's like, man, this place is dry spiritually i've been in places man with three or four people sitting at the, the guitars off key come on somebody i mean i've been in worship services with just a handful of people and man the power of god shows up in that room because it's not about what's outside it's what's on the inside of you it's about your heart right and the people are worshiping god and the power of god is moving so 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 i thought so i thought well if that's the case i got a chance come on somebody i got a chance there's a chance los you know, it's amazing to understand it. And, you know, uh, sometimes we get trapped in, in worries and things from our past. And those things start holding us back from doing really what God wants you to do. Let me ask you a question. Have God ever asked you to do something that you couldn't do? That the moment you got the question, you went, man, I can't do that. I can't do that. See, God, God's going to start asking you things to do. But just know if he asks, it's because he knows. He's going to ask you because he knows there's something inside of you. Come on, somebody. And if, you can't, and if that's not enough, then Google it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> now, now, in our biblical text, in Numbers chapter 14, we are eavesdropping on a conversation between Moses, I mean, between, uh, uh, yeah, between Moses and the Lord. But this discussion was actually a result of a conversation that started in chapter 13. So in chapter 13, the children of Israel were camped by the Jordan River, and now they decided it's time to send some spies. Everybody said, send spies. Well, they should have sent, but they, they need to send the right spies. Come on, somebody. See, they sent spies, but then when you heard the report, we have an issue with that. See, but due to their poor self-image and lack of faith, the consequences of their decision was devastating. A 12-day journey took 40 years turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor they took the long way for real <laughs> they
they took the long way because of the consequence, because of their decision. So see, in this text that we spoke about earlier, there are three observations. So if you're taking notes, here's the time to start taking notes. The first one is this. We observe their negative self-perception. Their negative self. In Numbers 13, we talked about that, 1331, it says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can attack those people. They are, we can't. Here we go. There's the word can't. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we. And they, spread, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said this. The land we explored devours those that are living. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim were the descendants of Anak from Nephilim. And listen to this. Here's, here's, here's where you really go south. We seemed uh, like grasshoppers. We, the word seems mean appear to be. How many other things can appear to be one way, but be another Just because they appear to be doesn't mean that they are. But they had such a negative self-image. They said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Listen to this. We, and we looked the same to them. Now, here's what I'm thinking. They're scouting the land. They gotta be a little bit of distance away from the giants. How do you know what I'm talking about? They're scouting the land from a distance, right? So, so, so how do they know what the giants are thinking if, the, if they never even saw them? Because we assume that people see us the way we see us. See, that's the problem. We assume, oh yeah, they just assume that we look like grasshoppers to them. They assumed all this stuff, but at the end of the day, they weren't even close enough for them to see them. And how could they even imagine what they were thinking? And you see, we also see a parallel of this in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, 17 and 18. It says this, when he came to his, everybody say, came to his senses. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to come to your senses. Come on, somebody. You got to come to your senses on this one. You got you to you come to your senses. And he says, he's, and when he came to his senses, he's the prodigal son who just rolled out. Now he's like, oh, my goodness. How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You see, he saw himself as a failure. He saw himself as someone who squandered everything that his father gave him. And he chose to after he lost everything. He stayed away because he was ashamed and he was embarrassed. And at the end, come on, he's being fed pig food. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't like pig food. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, I've never had pig food, so I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so, but, so he's eating pig food. He says, man, wait a minute. They're having filet mignon at my dad's house. Come on. They got, they got lamb. They got food. I mean, my dad, he's got it going on. And here I am eating pig food. I think it's time to come to my senses. So he came to his senses and he realized that even the hired servants were actually doing better than he was. And he was willing now. He saw himself as a failure. So now he's willing to come back to his dad and just be a servant. Just say, you know what, I, I'm done, I messed up, I, I'll just, I'll, can I just stay in the servant's quarters? Uh, can I just, I mean, can I just, you know, just eat whenever you need me to? I mean, I, I blew it so bad, I don't expect you to even give me anything. But how many of you, when you turn to God, come on, and his arms are wide open. The Bible says that he not only saw the son, he ran to him. He ran the moment he came in view. What does that tell me? It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter how far we are from God. It doesn't matter how big our sin is. The moment you turn to God, he will run to you. Come on, give the Lord a praise. He'll run to you and he'll reinstate you. You don't lose your position. God allows you to come back in. He gives you a ring and he gives you, I mean, the sandals. He gives you the authority back. He does all these things because at the end of the day, your calling is without repentance. Your position is your position. He wanted you there in the first place. So just know, listen, a lot of folks say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I, done, I did this and I did that and I should have known better. Listen, that's okay. I'm here to tell you, you might have messed up, but we serve a God of the turnaround. Come on, somebody. We serve a God that when you mess it up, it doesn't matter what you mess it up or somebody else messes it up he'll fix it come on turn to your neighbor say neighbor he always fixes it he always fixes it 
See, this is so important for us to understand. And, and you see, always remember this, that thoughts, thoughts, that's why your mind is so important, become perception. Perceptions become reality. So you know what? Change your thoughts, and you'll change your reality. Oh, come on, somebody. See, turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. <laughs> it's, it's right here. This is the battleground right here. It's, a, it's the smallest little battleground from one ear to the other. It's all right there, and that's what we battle on a regular basis. The second thing is this. We see God's perspective on his people. We see God's perspective on his people. Look at Numbers 14 now. It's, uh, verse 24 says, But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Now, hey, man, t- right now, turn your ear. He's talking about me. Come on. I'm the one with a different spirit. I go after God wholeheartedly. Come on, God. Can you give the Lord a praise and say, yeah, he's talking about us right now. Hallelujah. You see, while the majority of the spies were trapped in their negative self-thinking, God had a different perspective on his servant, Caleb, because Caleb had a different spirit. He recognized Caleb's faithfulness and his wholehearted devotion. And despite the challenges and the giants, God saw Caleb as a conqueror. See, with the others, there was a disconnect. There was an inconsistency to what God said and what, and what they believed. Oh, but Caleb, come on, somebody. Caleb, there was no disconnect. What God says is exactly who he was. See, and because he was able to do that, when none of them were able to cross over, when they had to, they had to be faded out in the desert for 40 years, Caleb crossed over. Come on, somebody. And his family crossed over, and they got the inheritance, and so did Joshua's family as well. At the end of the day, listen, because of their wholehearted faithfulness and trust the problem with the with the spies is that they were comparing themselves to their enemy come on if you're facing a giant come on now and you're looking at you and you're looking at them you go man I ain't, I, that ain't gonna happen come on somebody but when you compare them to god i don't care how big that giant is I don't care how big it is. Come on. A rock with a smooth stone is going to take him out. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, my God is bigger than any giant, than any problem, than any issue. Come on, somebody. Than any generational curse. See, my God is bigger than all of that. So when I compare my problems and my enemy with God, that's what Joshua and Caleb did. They didn't look at themselves. Come on. They said, wait, we got marching orders. That means if God gives you marching orders, that means start marching. Start taking the, plant, the land. Start possessing what he's giving you right now. If he said get it, then go get it. Come on, somebody. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you believe that. See, in Matthew 16, 16, I love this. Jesus asked Peter, who do they say I am? He asked all the disciples, who do they say I am? Well, you're a prophet, you're a teacher. Man, he stood up and said, wait a minute, no, no, time out. Y'all don't get this. He's the son of the living God. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. That's it, Peter. You got this. See, all of a sudden, you connected the dots. Not everybody connected them, but you did. And because of what you just said, because of what you just were revealed to by the Holy Spirit, he said, upon this rock... Upon this truth, upon this revelation, hallelujah, I'm going to build my church. Because the church will be built with people who know that I am the Son of God. That knew I went to the cross and died for them. I'm going to build a church with people that are fearless. Come on, somebody. Because they know their God. And the Bible says if you know your God, you can do great exploits. There is nothing that can't be done that God tells you to do that. He'll show up and fight the battle for you. He might even say, you know what? I love this. He'll, he'll tell you this. Step aside. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, step aside. Step aside. Get on the sideline for a minute. Come on, somebody. Just watch this. Come on. Just be still and know that I am God. Just stand to the side. You, I'm stepping in. And listen, and when I step into the fight... The fight is fixed. Oh, so y'all didn't hear that. When God steps into a fight, the fight is already fixed. He's going to win. He doesn't know how to lose. Come on. The devil is not an adversary that's even close to God. He's a created being. At the end of the day, when God steps in, you're going to win. Oh, turn your and say, neighbor, when God steps in, you're going to win. 
Uh, I'm in it to win it. Oh, uh, come on, give the Lord a praise if you believe that today. And the last thing is this. What must we do? Transform our minds with God's truth. Transform our minds with God's truth. Paul wrote this. And Paul, really, when he wrote this in the book of Romans, you got to remember who Paul was. And Paul had to have his mind renewed and because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was so edumacated. Come on, somebody. The guy, the guy had more degrees than a thermometer. How many know what I'm talking about? He was super intellectual. So he understood when he wrote this, he knew what he was talking about because he had to renew his mind. He was killing Christians thinking it was the right thing to do. But in Romans 12, 12, he says this. Do not be conformed, oh man, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oh. See, he encourages us today to start filling our minds with God's word. To start filling your, I mean, listen, we fill our minds with so much stuff. Nothing wrong with entertainment, but man, if you're spending more time in front of Netflix than your Bible, then you got issues. Come on, somebody. If you're, if you're spending more time watching the news and watching all this stuff and allowing all these things from the world take your peace away, take your hopelessness away, because at the end of the day, it looks so bad. Have anybody noticed that this world is in trouble? That our government is falling apart? That our economy is going, is tanking, not just ours, but so is China, and so is Russia, and so is every other nation in the world. See, when you start understanding that, guess what that is? That's a setup. Come on, somebody. That's a setup for Jesus' comeback. See, the Bible says, listen, the, the first thing you see in the, in, in the book of Revelation, it says, so, so when, when it's time, when I'm coming back, then you'll have to spend a whole bunch of gold just to get a loaf of bread. Transactions. Monetary transactions, that's where you're going to start seeing first. When that sign starts happening, come on somebody, when food keeps getting more expensive, when everything around you gets more expensive, and people are being laid off like crazy right now. See, there's going to be a, a time where it's going to get hard and difficult. And there's digital money being printed right now. There's going to be so many things happening around us. We got to get ready because the stage is being set. And if the stage is being set, we don't have to get caught off guard. We can prepare ourselves, man. Get close to God. Come on. Get away from Fox News. Come on. CNN News. Tune into the Word of God. Start getting in prayer. Start hearing what God has to say. Listen, I love the news. I got to hear it once in a while. But I stay more time in my Bible. I want to read. I want to stay so close to God. The Bible says that in the end times, the truth, come on, listen to this, that even the elect will be deceived. That even the elect that know the Bible, they won't know the difference of what's going on around them. So we got to get so close to God that we don't just look at what they're saying, that we're able to discern the spirit behind what they're saying. Oh, man. Hey, hey, come on, man. And you can only do that, come on, if you're walking in the spirit. Come on. If you're walking in the spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's going to sound good. But behind it is a demonic force. So you better know the truth. You better know the truth because... The devil always puts truth in his lies. He mixes it. So unless you know for real, unless you know for real, it's very easy to be deceived. See, I love this. Uh, John 8, 8, 8, 12 says, when Jesus spoke again to his people, he said, I am the light of the world. And you see, light dispels darkness. And if he's the light of your life and the light of your world, that means those dark areas are going to get lit. Turn to your neighbor. I'm getting lit. Come on, somebody. <laughs> things are going to get lit. God's going to start shining his light. So all the deception, all the things are going to start coming to light. You're going to start seeing the truth. And you're going to start seeing things. And guess, and guess what? Not everybody's going to agree with you. Some folks are going to think you're crazy. Come on, somebody. They're going to think you've done lost your mind. But listen, stay close to God. Stay close to God. See, I believe this. That the closer we get to God, the more we start thinking like him. The more we start talking like him. The more we start understanding and seeing like him as well. You know, several, I want to close with this story. <clears throat> several years ago, Rose and I had the amazing opportunity to go to Paris. 
and uh, it's a place that we've always wanted to go. So when we went, we put a little list. We were there for two days, so we went to the Eiffel Tower, but then we wanted to go to the Louvre. Go ahead and put that picture up. We went to the Louvre because we heard so much about the Louvre because I wanted to see the Mona Lisa. Come on, somebody. Not just a print. <laughs> the actual painting. It hangs right there. So we went and we walked. And, we, and by the way, it's, it's kind of small. I, I expected it to be like a big portrait. It was just like, it wasn't that big, right? We zoomed in a little bit so you could see. But we were there and we're like, we're so amazed. The art was out of this world. But there was another picture hanging there. And I didn't think about it much until I started preparing for this sermon. Put that other picture up there. That painting also hangs in the Louvre. It's entitled Checkmate. So when you look at the picture, it, it's, it's also a, 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 a kind of, kind of a, a metaphorical picture where the devil is on the left side like this. You got a little bit of a smirk. It looks like checkmate. The other gentleman is looking like, oh gosh, how do I get out of this one? There's an angel between them. You can't see the head. The head got cut off, but that little white, that's actually an angel back there observing this fight for somebody's soul and they're having a strategic game of chess to decide so one day there's a large group of people that came uh, to, to see this particular as they were walking through the loop and one of them happened to be a grand master at chess so as they were looking he kept looking at the pieces and he kept thinking about this thing and his friends continued they, eventually they all walked away but he stayed and later on, they, they're like, man, you're supposed to be with the rest of the group. He goes, no, I had to keep analyzing this board. I had to keep, and, and he said, I need to talk to the curator. Uh, Sir, I know, I know you're the curator of this place, but it says checkmate. I said, no. He said, see, I'm looking at the way they're placed. I'm seeing the way they're there. And see, here's what they couldn't see that a grandmaster at chess did. The king had one more move. Oh, come on, somebody. The king had one more move. And the checkmate would happen after the king moved. Oh, come on. Give the Lord a praise. See, they wrote checkmate not because of what they saw, because that one move. I'm here to tell you, the king has one more move. You may feel defeated today, but the king has one more move. Your family might be struggling today, but the king has one more move. The doctor gave you a bad report, but the king has one more move. Your business may be failing, but the king has one more move. It's not over till it's over, and the king is the one that says when it's over. It doesn't matter what you're going through today I'm here to let you know that the king still has one more move and the devil will be the one in checkmate come on give the Lord a praise <laughs>